us to apply it in the best way possible. And we thank you for this day. Pray all these things in your name. Amen. Good job. All right. Micah, thank you, everyone. Appreciate you guys singing. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to our passage this evening. If you have your bulletin, uh, it is referenced there if you need to. But uh, we'll pick up from where we left off last time that I was here on Sunday evening, which was a few weeks ago where I was teaching because it had two weeks without me. So you got a break from me. So, But now we're going to return back to Second Peter, and we will be in chapter 1, of course, first looking at verses 3 through 4. So 2 Peter tonight, verses 3 through 4 of chapter 1, and the title of the message is Our Resources in Christ. I'll tell you this little story. Uh, Vivian, for two and a half years, lived in a home without running water. She had to drive to a spring and load up a five-gallon jug to haul back home. All the while, there was a perfectly good well with, six, with a 600-gallon reservoir on her property. The water was there. She didn't know it could be used. You might think, what in the world does that have to do with Second Peter tonight? Well, as Christians, we are like Vivian sometime, never realizing or using the resources the Lord has already given to us to grow in Christ-likeness. Tonight, we're going to be in the second study in 2 Peter, and Peter's going to remind us that we have everything we need to live godly lives. God has provided himself for us, everything that we need to live the godly Christian life, to grow in maturity, to grow in Christ-likeness. We have everything. We don't need to go look somewhere else. And so this evening we're going to see where Peter, when he begins this body of the letter here, is going to tell us initially that we have everything. We don't need to go anywhere. We don't need to look for anything else. God himself has given to us everything that we need. Now, I'm going to do something a little different on this one. We only have uh, two verses that we're covering tonight. But since this is the second study and we've had a gap for two weeks, I'm going to review the background on the letter because 2 Peter is short, but there's a purpose by why he has it structured the way he does. And so we're going to look at that one more time, and then we'll look at verses 1 and 2, uh, the salutation. And so then we'll move into the body of the letter this evening. And so we'll look at verse 3. We have everything we need. And then in verse 4, we have His precious promises. We'll see His precious promises give us not only those truths, for instance, and I'll give you a few examples, but His promises, those precious ones that God has given to us, Peter says, enable us to do two things. And so we'll look at that. So we'll review the background on the letter, not quite as extensively as I did the first time, We'll see what verses 1 and 2 in the salvation uh, and salutation rather say. And then we'll look at the letter itself. We move into the body of the letter. And what Peter wants them to know is God has already given to them everything. They don't need to go look somewhere else. And then he's going to hone in on that God has given us promises, but they are precious and they serve a variety of purposes for us. And so let's go and let's review this letter one last time in terms of the setting, and so forth. This will be somewhat of a synopsis of what I looked at the first time. The author and the authorship is debated, if you remember. Uh, I made the case for that it is indeed the Apostle Peter and that it is Peter who writes the letter. If you recall that this was one of the letters that took a while to be canonized, in other words, actually make it into the canon. One of the reasons was there was an argument over, well, was this authentic? In other words, was Peter the author? And, of course, many people say, and most, I would say, do, but I made the case of why, because we need to know in case someone were to ask. For example, in 2 Peter 3.1, Peter says, 
This is now, beloved, the second letter that I'm writing to you. So we would assume that if he wrote 2 Peter, he probably wrote 1 Peter. If he wrote 1 Peter, he probably wrote, what do you think, 2 Peter? And, and so, but this is debated. And there's a lot of internal evidence I gave you the case for, two of which are in chapter 1. Peter says that I was there at the transfiguration, or in other words, whoever the author was, was there. We only know there was three people there. We also know that the author was told by Jesus that he would suffer martyrdom, and we know Peter was. So there's plenty of internal evidence for it, and so I'm making the case and presenting it that Peter is the author. We know the recipients of this are Christians that are in North Central Asia Minor. We might think of Turkey-ish today, or Turkey, I think is how they repronounce it today, Turkey, whatever they say, but anyway, it's in modern-day Turkey, that sort of area there, North Central Asia Minor. And I've set the arrows up there to give you a general area of it. And you see in 1 Peter chapter 1 where these locations come from. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, and Peter, after identifying himself there specifically, he says, to those who reside as aliens, this is not E.T., okay, these are strangers, in other words, Scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so that's who he's writing to. He's writing to this plethora of Christians there. These are probably primarily Gentiles. And the date of the writing of the letter is somewhere between 64 and 67. We know it couldn't be 68 because he was martyred in 67. I take it, actually, I would make an argument for this is towards the end of that period because he speaks of soon suffering martyrdom. And we'll see more on that later. But you're looking at somewhere in that window of time. So if you have any trouble grasping how long this is from when Peter denied Jesus, you're looking at some 30 plus years, give or take. And what you're going to find is, is that Peter has matured in the faith. Whereas before, he was big on exalting himself, looking at places of prominence. Here he sees himself as a servant. So he has certainly grown in his walk with the Lord, as I hope we would. I mean, I would hope that if you were 30 when you came to faith, that when you were 60 you had grown. One would hope, right? But that's not always the case, is it? Age is not always a criteria for wisdom because wisdom is knowledge applied. You can have all the knowledge you want, Peter says, but if you don't apply it, you're not very wise. Now, what's the purpose of the letter? You need to know why these authors write these books because it would be easy for me to just jump in. You ever had a pastor jump in and you're like, well, we just jumped in the pool and have no idea where we are. We need to know why he's writing what he does. Notice the purpose here, and this is my wording. If the believers grow in the knowledge of Christ and in their faith, they will be protected from false teachers as they await Christ's return in the new heaven and new earth. Very simple. And so today, we see where it's applicable today. Jesus hasn't returned yet. Our hope is in the new heaven and the new earth. And what has God given to us to protect us? Well, we'll begin to see that tonight in the body of the letter. And the letter itself is structured that way. I use the analogy, it's not original to me. Bank tellers, if you remember, how do they know what is false? They study the truth. They become so familiar, and then we've begun to lose this, I think, in about five or ten years. I'm not going to be able to use this because we've become cashless society probably by then, uh, all preparing for the Antichrist, which is another story for another day. But if you think about it, how do bank tellers know what is false? They study the real thing so much that when they come across it, they're like, wait a minute, this, this isn't what I know. Do you understand what Peter's doing in the structure when I show it to you? Is he doesn't want you studying what is false. My friends, I'm going to just say this to you as nicely as I can. If you spend all of your time studying that which is false, you will never arrive at the truth. You understand that's sort of what Peter is going to drill home. Because I know some Christians who like to just tear into things. Notice the way Peter has this structured. What does he do? Well, first they need to grow in the knowledge of Christ and in their faith. And he says that true knowledge is found in God's Word. So that when you get to chapter 2, you'll begin to do what? 
you'll naturally begin to recognize that which is false. See, what my endeavor for you is that you become so familiar with who Christ is and who and what his word teaches that when you leave and you go out in the week and you say, no, wait a minute, that doesn't line up with what the Bible says, then you are protected by that which is false. That's the idea of what Peter is giving. So chapters 1 and chapter 2, 1 prepares you for the false teacher because you know the truth so well. 2, by the time you know it so well, it's easy to recognize it. And then 3, God's promises are certain. And he uses the idea of, I love this chapter, creation and the second coming. So more on that later. Now last time, if you were with us in verses 1 and 2, if you remember of 2 Peter, Peter said, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Christ Jesus, to those who've received a faith of the same kind as ours. Do you know that you have the same faith and standing before God as Peter? And that same faith and standing comes by what? The righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Isn't that amazing? The idea here is that there's no superiority complex with Peter. I don't know if you know, and I'm going to use air quotes, Christian circles. There are certain, I don't even want to call them denominations, Roman Catholicism, for instance. They have Peter on this high pedestal. Peter doesn't propose himself that way. You and I are on equal footing before Jesus Christ because of the faith and the righteousness of Jesus himself. But then he goes on and he explains that we have multiplied grace and peace. How? As we grow in the knowledge of Christ. And that is true. As you grow in the word of God, you will grow in peace. Why? Because that is where God gives us, for instance, those promises we look at later. How many of us turn to the world looking for the solutions and looking for peace? You won't find it. But yet we are sort of drunk on this idea that the world has the answers. Jesus Christ and his word are the only source for us to find the things that we need. We don't need to be consumed with anyone else or anything else. And so Peter makes this, if you will, staggering claim If you just focus on that which is true and grow in Christ's likeness, many of the worries that you have will be quickly fading away. Now, having said all of that, as we look at verse 3, we're going to see that we have everything we need. We don't need to go out to the Christian bookstore or some sort of something new that has come along. We have everything that has been given to us when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, we may have things that supplement those that help us understand, but the Holy Spirit prayer, and in particular His Word, those are the sources that Christ has given to us. And so Peter wants us to know from the beginning not to worry. Because by God's power, we have everything we need to live a godly life, and we don't have any excuses for not doing so. Christ has given to us His Word, and God Himself has given to us everything that we could possibly need to live the godly Christian life. So let's read verses 3 and 4. This is where we move into the body of the letter. We've seen the salutation, Simon, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Peter has gone from the idea of exaltating himself to seeing himself as a servant. He's written to those particular Christians. He's told them, if you will grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, you will grow in grace and peace. Now he moves into telling you that you have everything that you need to grow in Christ and have a godly life. Let's read verses 3 and 4. Seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and excellence, for by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust." So as we begin looking at this, Peter uses this word twice, but I'm going to mention it on verse 3 because it is a very important one and it serves various purposes. You notice in both verses he uses what we would see in the Greek, we translate it as granted. 
Now have the Greek word up there. I know sometimes you all like to go and study these in depth. The Greek word is one of these ones here where it's very helpful. Because in Greek, what you have is that it is something that is given in the past, but it has ongoing benefits or ongoing effects to it. So in other words, it's not as though someone has given you something in the past and that's it. But when he uses this particular word in the Greek, it says that God has granted to you something and that something has effect on into the future. So it has this ongoing, if you will, benefit to it. The other thing to note about something that is granted, it isn't something that is earned. God himself gives you this by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In other words, by having faith in Jesus, he gives to you things in the past, and the past we'll see is salvation, and that thing he's given to you has this ongoing effect. And you think, why does that matter? Because God's power enables us to live and serve and grow in him, and what he has given to us is complete. God doesn't give 75%. God doesn't give 99%. God gives completely. Everything that God has given to us at the point of salvation, at the point of His Word, is sufficient just as much today as it will be until the future. It has this ongoing effect, and the purpose behind that is because He wants them to know that they don't need to look for something new. I love the old expression by Harry Ironside, if it's something new, it's probably not true. And that is very true in theology, not always, but the idea is this sort of coming to some new knowledge that we'll look at later on. And we have that problem today in the church. The church today is infused by what we would call a form of Gnosticism, which is New Age mystics. And we have them in their guised as Christians today. And we'll see this later as we go excuse me, through the book. So at no point in the future has God not given you and I provision for what we need for a godly life. Now, what has God's power given us? Again, everything, but notice the way this is phrased. So this is something that isn't earned. God in His graciousness gives these various truths to us. But notice what it says. It says that he's given us everything pertaining to what comes first and what comes that follows. First is life, and life is being this idea of salvation. How does one come to true life? In other words, we come to life. This is the idea of life is first in terms of salvation. Peter is pointing back and saying that God at the point of salvation, when you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, he has begun to give you everything you need for life, but then he's given you everything for godliness. Now I have it spelled out there for you. It is salvation, justification, but he's also giving you everything to live the godly life every single day you go out this week. I hate to put it to you this way. You can't go before God and say, well, you know, God, you didn't warn me. God doesn't take excuses because he's given us everything that we need to grow and to do that. And so this is this idea of growing in godliness. I stick to these three just because they're simple. At the point of salvation, what do we have in a sense? I know we have salvation and all that, so that's true. God has given to you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which we'll see, which is never taken from us. It's permanent until the day of redemption. You can pray You don't need to call me. I mean, I don't mind praying for you, but there's an access that is now available that wasn't before. And we have the truth of his eternal word. We have no excuse not to grow in our walk with the Lord. And so that's the idea. Now, I use this as an example, and I try to be a little careful with this because I know this isn't a perfect one. But when a child is bored, typically they have everything they need to grow. They just have to mature and grow. When you experience the new birth, as Jesus described to Nicodemus, God gave you everything you need to grow. He didn't need to give you something else. You didn't have to go and earn it. God's given everything to you. He's given you His Holy Spirit. You can now access God before you had no access to Him in the sense and the intimacy that is available today. And you have His precious Word. Uh, Again, this is what the idea here is. Now, I want you to notice a particular phrase here. And then I'm going to look at something with... Paul, you notice he says, seeing that God has given to us, we haven't earned, 
but He's given to us everything we need for salvation, for growing in Christ's likeness. But notice the means through true knowledge. Look with me in Colossians chapter 1. I use this because it is a good reference, but Paul was writing to a time where New Age, we would think of today, was beginning to be formed. Gnosticism doesn't really kick in until the second century. Uh, We have Gnosticism in a form, I believe, today in the church. I can name things right off the top of my head that are basically mystics. But that's the story for another day. But if you'll notice here, Paul is writing saying essentially the same idea here. Because he's fighting in Colossians against this false knowledge, this special hidden knowledge. That's the idea of Gnostics. But notice Colossians, I have it up there for you, 9 and 10. It's very similar to Peter. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, We have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? Well, notice, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respect, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of yourself, no, in the knowledge of God. It is no real different. It would be a variation. What Paul is saying here is, that you need to grow in spiritual wisdom so that your walk every single day is worthy of God and what He has done. You bear fruit and you need to increase in what? Knowledge of God and His Word. That's why He's given that Word to us in many ways. So it's very similar to, to what Peter has there in 1 Peter. So essentially what you have in verse 3 is a very simple truth that we need to remember which is the better we grow in the knowledge of God, the better we can live and please Him. It actually fits somewhat well with this morning. You remember? How much of God's Word do we need to know? All of it. We need to know the pleasing part as well as the displeasing part. Otherwise, we might do things that displease Him. And so God's divine power, Peter says, has given the Christian everything they need to live a godly life. We have the indwelling of the Spirit. We can pray to God whenever. We have Christ. We have His Word. What more could you ask for and why would we look somewhere else? I've never been able to get a Christian really to ever explain to me why we seem to sometimes think in the church that we need to look to other places. That is foreign to what God's Word teaches. God has given us everything we need. Now, you'll notice, so we see that we have everything we need to grow in Christ-likeness. But Peter goes on to say that we have his precious promises, meaning God's. And they are the means, and they are one of the means, at least, to help us to grow in godliness. A simple way to remember verses 3 and 4 is this. Verse 3 is that God is given to us by his divine power. Verse 4 is that he's given to us his divine promises. If you have God's power and you have God's promises, you have essentially everything that we could ever imagine that we need. Now in verse 4, Peter still goes into this idea here of knowledge. There is this idea here of knowledge. Now the Greek word here is epigenosis or gnosis. That's where we get the idea of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is a very complex but simple way of looking at this is this. Gnosticism is secret knowledge. And it just so happens the person that have it is the only one who has access to it, and you don't. And if you would do what they tell you, they would give you that information. That is essentially the core of Gnosticism. It is secret knowledge. And what Peter is trying to get across to the people is God's word's not hidden. God's Word is there. If you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you by very nature, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you should have a desire for God's Word. I don't know about you, but have you ever been at a time before you came to faith in Jesus and you try to read His Word? It's confusing and it's mumbo-jumbo. When you come to faith in it, it begins to, hear me when I say this, it begins to make sense. That is one of the triggers I know when people have salvation or not, is a desire for God's Word, but it is this ability to grow in it. It isn't a perfect knowledge. Look, I don't have it. 
but you should have a desire and a hunger for it. If you don't have a desire or a hunger for God's Word and or you have a complete inability to understand it, come talk to me because something there is missing and it's the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit gives us that ability there. But let's go back here. So God's Word, what Peter says in verse 4, you'll notice he brings in one of his favorite words, precious. He sees Salvation, the blood of Christ, and so many things is precious. He says that God's promises are precious. Now, why would God's promises be precious? God cannot lie. And so if God can't lie, every single thing that He's written will come to pass. I'm going to clarify something for you, and you may not like this, and you may not talk to me after the service, but you'll get over it by next week. I think the reason why Christians sometimes miss this promise and forget what God is saying here, is because we equate man's version of promise with God's. You and I make promises, and we've broken them before, haven't we? God cannot lie, so when he writes something in his word, it's going to come to pass. When he wrote that he brought forth everything that existed, he did. When he says that he's coming back in power and glory and he's going to destroy all earthly kingdoms and establish one final kingdom through Jesus Christ, he's going to do it. We sometimes, though, I think equate human promises with God's promises. And don't do that because we don't always fulfill them, but God does. So God's word is filled with many promises. And let me ask you, have you ever had a problem and you went looking somewhere else other than God's word? And I'm sure we have. I'm going to do something a little different, and I know this is about as different as it gets with me. I've used this book before. I reference it sometimes. I would encourage you to get this, and I don't always reference books sometimes in terms of purchasing unless it's like a commentary or something. This is a little bit different. This is one of those promises books. I don't know if you've ever seen them before. I'm pausing here. I'm not going down too far of a rabbit trail where we'll get lost because it has to do with what Peter's talking about here. This is this book. I've referenced it before. I've given it to people who've come and met with me. It's just basically this. It is a collection of scriptures that are organized thematically. And so if you ever have a problem with a particular subject, you turn to it and you read God's Word. It's not anyone's opinion. It's not Pastor Dennis's or Pastor Stephen's opinion. And so it's very helpful. And I want you to see a practical way in which God's promises help us because my fear is that we look to everywhere else. We go to Twitter or TikTok or Face. I mean, because Facebook is, of course, authoritative today, right? But if you suffer with worry or anxiety and you are looking for help, look with me in Isaiah 26.3. I may try to do this one because I, I, I like the New King James Version of this and I, I try to remember it by memory, but uh, Isaiah 26, 3 in the New King James, if my memory is correct, it renders it a little bit better than this, meaning it, I just like the flow of it, okay? That's just basically what I'm saying. Basically what it says is, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. God will keep us in perfect peace with the criteria that we keep ourselves focused on Him. And we focus on Him because we trust Him. And we trust that God will help us in whatever that predicament is. A lot of times what worry or anxiety is, is that we focused on things that are external or whatnot. But if we focus on the Lord, how many of us have ever been tempted to sin? If you haven't, you will. Look at with me, look with me in Psalm 119, verse 11. I'm doing this for two reasons, because I want you to know you can really turn to God's Word. It's not just some sort of folklore that pastors use. You can really turn there and get answers to the questions we need for godly living. If you are ever tempted, here's the answer to it. Now, this is probably why people stop coming to counsel with me sometimes, because they, they get a little burr under their saddle when I use this one. But if you ever get tempted, use this one. Your word I have treasured in my heart so that I might not sin against you. See, if you have God's word hidden in your heart, be able to turn to it in the time of need and it will be able to help you, keep you from sinning. The problem isn't God. 
The problem isn't his word. His problem, our problem is what? Ourselves. But if we would hide God's word in our heart, we wouldn't have to worry about that. We would know the means by which we could escape the temptations. What about discouragement? Well, God's word can't help us there, can it? John 16.33. John 16.33 is the theme of the upper room discourse. In other words, it encapsulates everything he tells the 11 disciples. Because Judas has abandoned him, in other words. These things, what is it? The entire upper room discourse. Chapter 13 through chapter 16. These things I have spoken to you, that is the disciples, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have, it is in Greek, thalipsis, which is trouble. But take courage, I have overcome the world. We have peace in a world that is always going to be in travail until Jesus has returned. But we have peace in this world knowing that Jesus has overcome on the cross. And then one day he's going to do one more thing. Do you have hope for the future? If you have hope, I want you to turn to 2 Peter. Hopefully you can find that now. 2 Peter chapter 3. But before I read this, I want to say something to you. And I want you just to consider it. Don't shoot me with this. I want you to consider it. Are you hoping that when the election happens that everything will work out? Are your hopes in the political system? Are your hopes in man? Are your hopes in anything else beyond that? Is your hope in the stock market? Is your hope in... You just fill in the blank. You have misplaced your trust and your hope and you are in error. Because you are not trusting in God. You are not trusting that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the one who will ultimately come back and restore a kingdom of perfect righteousness. That's the kingdom that Christians are looking for. I hope. Notice what 2 Peter says. Our hope is not in those things that man tries to manufacture. Our hope is in the return of Jesus Christ and the fruit that will come after it. Notice what he says. 2 Peter 3, 9 and 13. The Lord is not slow about his what? Notice, promise. As some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any, of us, for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. What a gracious God. But notice verse 13. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That is what Peter is saying. He says our hope in the future is that one day Jesus will come back. Jesus is going to fulfill Daniel chapter 2 because he's going to crush all of the kingdoms of this world and he's going to establish the final kingdom which is the kingdom of Jesus Christ and it will be the first time that righteousness will be on this earth. So I ask you, why would we place our hope in that which is temporary versus that which is eternal? My hope is that Jesus is going to come back because God has promised it. My hope is that Jesus will establish righteousness on the earth. My hope knows that it's not going to happen before then. And we would stop worrying about all that goes on in this world if we would do what? Turn back to the promises of God's word. I love Wearsby's statement on promises. It says, God's promises are precious because they, their value is beyond calculation. If we lost the word of God, there would be no way to replace it. Now, what do God's promises allow us to do? I want to make sure we're clear on not so much the second one. The second one is somewhat self-explanatory. The first one is one that I want to make sure we're clear on because some cults twist this, Mormons twist this into saying that you will be a god. I don't know if you know that. Uh, if they ever come knocking at your door, ask them, doesn't your doctrine teach that you become a god? This is the verse they use. Notice what Peter says here. He says, and this is the he says I'm referring to here, is verse 4. Notice what he says. Let's read it one last time. For by these he has granted, God has given, we haven't earned, his precious and magnificent promises. We're good there. But notice why. So that we may partake in the divine nature. It means in Greek to take a share in it. We have a share. We will be like Jesus when he returns. We don't become gods. 
when you and I believe in Jesus Christ at we by faith alone we receive justification and then Christ likeness begins to help us grow we have and we share in similarities we don't become gods to partake means to share in it means to take a portion of we you know that you have the spirit of almighty God living in you what a glorious truth that is but you're not a god where does that lie originate Isaiah 14, Satan says, I'm going to be like the Most High God. No one will ever be God. There's only one true God in Jesus Christ whom he sent. There is no other God. We don't become gods ever. That is the idea of what cults teach. What Peter is saying is we actually receive by faith the Holy Spirit. God lives within us through the Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons is so that we grow in Christ's likeness. Galatians 2.20 says what? Well, let's look and see here. I just want to make sure you're clear. Peter isn't saying we become gods. That's the lie of the devil. We do partake and we do become like Jesus uh, when he returns. But in Galatians 2.20 is another good example. We have this indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit enables us to do what? Well, to grow in Christ's likeness, that's really your goal. The goal of the Great Commission is to evangelize and disciple. And you see this in many places. I'm just using this for an example. I have been crucified with Christ. When was Paul crucified? Of course, at salvation in brevity form. And it is no longer I that live, but notice, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the same idea of what Peter is saying, that you have the life of Christ, in other words, the Holy Spirit living in you. You are no longer to begin or to be living, in other words, living for yourself. You're supposed to live for God and to become like Him. Charles Ryrie sums this up really well. Believers, notice I underline this for emphasis, share in the life of of God by means of Christ in the Spirit living in Him. Remember the word. It is not you become a God, you share, you partake in that, and that's the Holy Spirit. The cults want you to be like gods, and that's because that is the lie of Satan. So the promises of God show us that we have the divine nature, we have the Holy Spirit. He helps form us into Christ's likeness. But then notice this next one. It's no excuse, is it? No excuse for moral corruption in our lives. Notice, he enables us to escape the moral corruption of the world we live in. Do you know the world we live in is corrupt? If you didn't know that, and I'm the first to ever tell you, I'm sorry. I apologize by the grace of God, but it's true. The world around us is ungodly, and we have a means of escape by what God has given to us. In other words, you don't have to live a carnal, ungodly, unmoral life because you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Scripture, you have everything. Friends, when you stand before God, it bears repeating, you will not be able to use the escape card. No, I didn't know. He's going to say, that's because you didn't read my word. There's not going to be an excuse. And so we have the ability to escape. So the main thing in verse 4 is that the Lord has given us provision to overcome what? We cannot on our own. The Spirit of God gives us that ability to do so. Let me read you something um, before we try to finish up here, because I I think he sums it up pretty well here, if it'll go forward. Uh, If not, I'll just read it. Can you move it forward for me, Samuel? As we live in... The practical enjoyment of what God has promised, we become more and more conformed to His image. For instance, He has promised that the more we think about Him, the more we will become like Him. We make this promise a reality by reading the Word, studying Christ as He is revealed in it, and following Him. As we do, the Holy Spirit changes us into His likeness from one degree of glory to another. So what can we learn from this? 
Through Christ, we have everything we need to live a godly life. Two, God's word should be treasured by all of his people. And then three, the Lord has graciously provided us provision to escape moral corruption. Because without God's help, we wouldn't have the ability to do it. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. It is just as true as when Peter wrote it, as when we read it this evening. Father, I pray that we be reminded today that we need not look anywhere else. You yourself have given us by your divine power everything we simply need. You've given to us. We haven't earned it any more so than we could earn salvation. How gracious you are, Lord. Father, I thank you. You've given us everything we need from the point of salvation until the very end of our lives. Lord, you've also given us your precious promises. Lord, I pray that we would turn to them and not to the world. Lord, we are guilty sometimes of turning to the world and the things of the world when you've given us everything we need through your word. Father, I thank you. Your word also reminds us that we have the Holy Spirit. The temple of God lives within us. But we also have the ability by the power of the Spirit to escape all corruption in our own lives by simply living out the truths of your word. Father, I pray that we would be those Christians that follow your word because your word is true and we thank you for all that it gives us, Lord. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen.